process of discovering and accepting who you are and then sharing that identity with people. The process of coming out involves self-disclosure of one sexual orientation and or gender identity. National Coming Out Day has been observed in October since 1988. It recognizes members of the LGBTQIA community. That's an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual. Don't ask me to say this again. Coming out always starts with a conversation with yourself. For me, talking to friends and relatives about their coming out experiences is both fascinating and heartbreaking. I attended a workshop hosted by Covenant Network for Presbyterians on June 4th. Covenant Network is a group that for the past 25 years has been advocating to make the Presbyterian church more inclusive, working toward a church as generous and just as God's grace. One of the Covenant Network speakers that day suggested that it's not just the LGBTQIA plus folks who need to come out. It's all of us. First, we need to come out to ourselves. We need to decide how we're going to be ethical people. Since coming out always starts with a conversation with yourself, I thought I'd let you in on a conversation that I needed to have with myself a while back. Being born and raised in the South, we were taught to be polite, not to make waves. Maybe some of you were raised that way too. But some years ago, I realized that it was crucial for me to come out as a Presbyterian pastor who's supportive of our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQIA plus community. For me, the decision was ethical and personal. It was about justice and equality. Knowing far too many lives have been harmed by people and places, Christians, churches, other faith communities that were supposed to offer people love and acceptance compelled me to do something. Knowing the stories of God's children who are directly affected by the choices that we make as a church, by the things we say or don't say. Hearing about the condemnation and shaming so many have received meant that I needed to speak up. Because welcome, especially in the church, is about being seen and known and affirmed. It's about having access to community because we believe that God is experienced in community where two or three are gathered together in his name, Christ is there. So if there's anyone who's systematically excluded for any reason, we're not just depriving them of tasty lemon squares, we're blocking people's access to our savior. And that is a scandal to the gospel. Church has to be a place where people can meet God, a safe place where people can say, this is where I feel I belong, where people are truly and fully loving, like God is. The God is with us and for us, all of us. Which brings me to a verse from a little three chapter book in the Old Testament that's tucked between two H books, Habakkuk and Haggai. It's Zephaniah. Zephaniah is one of the books in the Old Testament that's one of the so-called minor prophets, but Zephaniah brings a major message. There's a passage from Zephaniah in your bulletin, and I'm going to read the last verse. The Lord your God is with you. God is mighty to save. God will take great delight in you. God will quiet you with love. God will rejoice over you with singing. 
This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. That verse, Zephaniah 3, 17, tells such a crucial, a crucial truth about God that it's been called the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. God isn't way out there, somewhere far, far away. God is with us right here, right now. God is with us in the highs and lows of our lives and in the normal everyday moments like washing dishes or making breakfast, weeding the garden or walking the dog or the cat. I saw someone up on the levee today walking two dogs and a cat. It was wonderful. The cat was actually lagging behind and so the man said, come on, Frankie, you're holding up the show. That was great. God doesn't just watch over us. God is walking with us through life. Even when you feel like you're all alone, God's message is, I'm here. In all the details and frustrations and complex choices of life, God says, I'm near to assist and support and strengthen you. I'm going to be with you no matter what. Zephaniah says, believe that. Believe that God is with us, around us, beside us, delighting in us, present with us in every moment. The challenge, the invitation for us is to become more and more aware of that, aware of God's presence, present to the depths of each moment, seeing God in more and more people, in all people, in the events and happenings of everyday life. Then Zephaniah says something else. He says, God is here for us. God is mighty to save. What in your life needs to be saved? What relationship? What hurt? What dream? Psalm 34 says that God is near to the brokenhearted, that God saves those who are crushed in spirit. Even when life gets really hard or when we mess up big time, God is for us. For too long, too many people, especially those in the LGBTQIA plus community, have been told that God is ticked off at them because of who they are or what they've done. God has a perpetual We all need to know that God delights in us. Zephaniah brought us this message from God. God will take great delight in you. God will rejoice over you with singing. May our hearts know about the God who delights in us, the God who is with us and for us, for all of us. We know we're not there yet. Not all Christians see it that way which means that we need to get educated by studying scripture together to equip ourselves to have conversations with those whose exclusionary take on scripture harms those in the LGBTQIA plus community and their families, harms all of us. So in the months to come, we're gonna offer opportunities to study together, to talk about how for hundreds of years the Bible has been used inappropriately to oppress people. Those holding to an exclusionary interpretation of the Bible point to six, at most eight, passages in scripture which refer to same-sex behavior out of 31,000 verses in the Bible, six or eight to 31,000. Together, those six to eight verses cover a maximum of 12 pages in the Bible. And none of these texts is about Jesus, nor do they include any of his words. That's why we're called to remain open to the Holy Spirit, teaching us through scripture, calling the church to be fully inclusive of all God's children. That's why in 2018, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA voted to affirm its commitment to the full welcome, acceptance, and inclusion 
of transgender people, people who identify as gender non-binary, and people of all gender identities within the whole life of the church and the world. It went further to lament the ways that policies and actions of the Presbyterian Church have caused gifted and faithful LGBTQIA plus Christians to leave the Presbyterian Church so that they could find a more welcoming place to serve as they've been gifted and called by God's spirit. That's not just a Presbyterian thing. It's an American thing. For in 2010, President Barack Obama designated June as LGBT Pride Month in the US. I quote, this month as we recognize the immeasurable contributions of LGBT Americans, we renew our commitment to the struggle for equal rights for LGBT Americans and to ending prejudice and injustice wherever it exists. And last month, on May 31st, President Joe Biden issued a follow-up presidential proclamation on Pride Month. His proclamation included this message. This month, we honor the resilience of LGBTQIA plus people who are fighting to live authentically and freely. We affirm our belief that LGBTQIA plus rights are human rights and we recommit to delivering protection, safety, and equality to LGBTQIA plus families so everyone can realize the full promise of America. I call upon the people of the United States, President Biden said, to recognize the achievements of the LGBTQIA plus community, to celebrate the great diversity of the American people, and to wave their flags of pride high. If you came to church through the front door today, you saw a rainbow pride flag hanging on the front fence post of the church. Thanks to William for engineering a way to hang it up there. In 1978, artist Gilbert Baker was commissioned by San Francisco City Supervisor Harvey Milk one of the first openly gay elected fitch holes in the US to make a flag for the city's upcoming pride celebrations. Baker, a prominent gay rights activist, gave a nod to the stripes on the American flag, but he also drew inspiration from the rainbow to reflect the many groups within the gay community. And as a struggling drag performer, who was accustomed to creating his own garments, he was well equipped to sew the soon to be iconic symbol. I love that story. The rainbow flag blowing in the breeze at the entry gate to Parkview Church today isn't just a colorful declaration. It's a symbol of solidarity. It says that Parkview stands with the LGBTQIA plus community. What might have happened if more Americans had hung signs or marched with banners in support of Japanese Americans in 1942, when partnering with God and working and equality for everyone. God's spirit is calling us to come out, to venture out, to be visible and vocal about this inclusive thing that God is doing with real people who have a real commitment to following Jesus Christ. Rainbow on, Parkview. Rainbow on. Amen.